Oh, hi, Sister Durham, Brother Durham. Uh, looks like you're maybe the uh, maybe the first ones in here. Just giving a little bit of time for everyone to get on. <laughs> so you use tonight's broadcast and just maybe it'd be a little bit of a uh, using y'all all as a soundboard I'm I am working on this uh, the seven last plagues that I talked on last Sunday. I've been working on it more and and um, so it's a uh, I've had some new thoughts on it. I'm just kind of trying to get it all put together in my mind. I'm like the little the little boy that Elisha had to resurrect from the dead when he was was at the harvest with his daddy and he said, my head, my head. <laughs> That's the way I felt lately. My head, my head. It's just been swimming with uh, different things that I feel like God's dealing with me about, the word of God. Uh, so it looks like several are starting to get on here. Um, so, um, we'll, um, we'll start the broadcast tonight. Um, for those of you, I don't know how many was on it heard me, but I'm just mentioning that I was going to, uh, I hope I'm not taking advantage of you, but I'm going to maybe use you as a sounding board a little bit. Because I've been working, you know, uh, here during this pandemic, uh, I've been working a lot on, you know, what time we're living in, of course, how the, what the pandemic, uh, what it, uh, it, what God has in store in the pandemic for everyone. And of course, I, I do believe that God is getting the, the Gentile world ready for uh, a time of judgment. Um, I, um, um, you know, we, we have taught uh, that there is a 45-year period. There was in the end of the Jewish world, and there will be in the end of the Gentile world. And I've used that from A.D., it going back to the Jewish world, uh, A.D. 33, uh, and 45 years would take you to A.D. 78. And um, I know the Romans destroyed the temple in A.D. 70, but the judgment didn't just stop right there. I think it uh, continued for uh, those other eight years. Uh, it could have been a shorter period of time if AD 33 is not a correct date. Like if it's AD 30, it would take you to AD 75. Um, but we're using that time frame from the ninth chapter of the book of Revelations. And um, I don't know. I, I'm having a little bit of trouble finding out exactly how to share my screen on Facebook, I found out how to do it very well on 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 uh, Zoom. Uh, sometimes I've thought about us turning this broadcast into a Zoom meeting, but uh, I don't know if everyone has Zoom, so it's not anything I've pursued as of yet. Um, maybe if everyone that is viewing tonight would just. Um, comment that you have Zoom, and that would sort of let me know how many people actually 
could get on the, on the Zoom meeting instead of a broadcast. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, I, I, uh, I do feel God's getting the world ready, and I do believe that the Lord is dealing with the body of Christ because I think the body uh, judgment first must begin at the house of God, Peter said. And so I don't think God can use us to judge the world if he if we're not uh, if we're not truly righteous, and that's why it's going to take a restored church. Um, I was mentioning in the ninth chapter of the book of Revelations, about midway through the ninth chapter, he starts dealing with the four angels in the in the river Euphrates that was loosed for a year and a, a day and a month and an hour. Well, we've used, of course, uh, I'll just quickly say that the, the year uh, in, in Bible prophecy, it's a day for a year and a year has 360 days in it. And so that would be 360 years. And I've used that from AD 43 until 1903. And then the the day is a hundred year day. Um, uh, and that would be, uh, the 360 years would be the, the restoration of the Protestant era, Protestant movement from 1543 to 1903. And then from a um, uh, hundred years from 1903 until 2003, which is when God healed the body. Uh, the body began to come back together. All the different uh, divisions of the body came back together. Um, there was That made two 50-year jubilees, a jubilee from 1903 to 53. 1953 is when the new experience took place at the campground in the body. And then... Uh, 50 years after that would be 2003. Brother Souders was teaching that God would do something special after he died, which he died in November of 2002. I'm sorry, in 1952. And the following campground is when the new experience fell. And Brother Mullinaw uh, gave out, uh, no, I believe it was uh, Sister... Oh, Mills, I believe, that gave out the message in tongues laying on the campground. Uh, you know, everyone was between services, fell out on the campground in the spirit. She gave out a message in tongues and Brother Mullinaw interpreted it. And he said, this <clears throat> is just a drop in the bucket of what I have for my people. And this is to give you strength and help you uh, in the times ahead. And so that new experience began to hit different assemblies after that campground meeting and a, a great uh, strength touched the assemblies in the body of Christ. Well, Brother, Brother Leninger was preaching in 2002 that we should have a, um, a jubilee. If you go back in the Bible and study a jubilee, in Israel, a Jew, in a jubilee, all uh, debts were forgiven. All Jew servants, slaves were freed. And all inheritance was restored. In other words, you could, you could sell your land, uh, but it, you could only sell it for 50 years of his, you know, or however long it was to the next Jubilee, if there's just five years left, well, there, your land wouldn't be worth as much. If you were a slave, uh, you had to be freed on the, uh, on the Jubilee. I'm talking about a Hebrew slave. And all debts had to be forgiven. If you loaned money to someone, they had to have it. It was all due within that ju at that time of Jubilee. If there was anything left over, it was forgiven. They didn't have to pay anymore. And that's a picture when God healed this body. Brother Leninger was preaching, we, we should have another jubilee in 
2003, which would be 50 years after the new experience. Well, Brother, uh, Brother Leninger was looking for a, a uh, great move of the Spirit like there was in the new experience. And that's what, that was projected so most of us, that's what we were looking for. But what we got was actually greater than that experience. It was actually when God healed the body and all of the different sec all the different groups, separate groups came back together and the body was healed. I can remember when I came into the body of Christ, I remember men like Brother Mears, Brother Clyde Patton, Brother James Souders, Brother Atwell. Those men when they talked about uh, when they talked to, excuse me, they talked about the body uh, being healed. They never lost hope of that. And they always had a uh, tender spot for anyone that had been in Brother Souders' um, camp, you might say, uh, or had received his message and had a vision of the body of Christ whatever happened that caused it to, to separate, those men always had a, uh, a hope and faith that it someday would heal. I remember when I was just a young man and hadn't been in the body very long, I remember one morning I, was, <clears throat> I had a bedroom that I prayed in and I went in that bedroom and I was praying and God touched me that morning and I got so broke up and I wasn't here when the body had divisions and separations. I was, that was before my time. And, uh, but I got so broke up and I felt like that morning that I could feel God's heart of how God wanted that to heal and how he had waited and been patient for when it could be healed. And then I, you know, I just, I just had such a brokenness wanting to see God's people come together because I felt like that how in the world are we going to help Babylon and this world of religion if we can't, if we can't come together and heal our own problems? How are we going to help our brethren that are out in Babylon? Because we all had a similar vision and we're going to have to help men that doesn't have that vision and so, um, anyway, but when this body began to come together, I got so blessed in that, and I realized a jubilee. It, all the debts, everything that took place, everything that took place in the past. Uh, let me turn this off. I didn't know it was on. I'm sorry. Um, everything that took place, you know. Uh, anything that was done wrong, God, God was able to forgive that. The men were able. Finally, God got men on every side willing to forgive anything in the past. Most of us didn't have a dog in the fight. You know, most of us, it, we weren't there when all that happened. A few older brethren were, but I know they were blessed by seeing it come together. And then slaves, whatever group you were in, you were, you were a slave to that group because you believed that group was right. And we all, every group thought that the other group was going to have to, um, they were going to have to be the ones come to you. Uh, when the coming together took place, God began to touch our hearts. And we began to realize we just all need to come together. We need to quit worrying about who, who was at fault, but we just need to come back together and forgive the past and move forward. And that's what we did. And um, so uh, God blessed us in that uh, inheritance, everyone's inheritance back to the body of Christ being one body was restored. And God made that available for everyone. And so <clears throat> that was a hundred year period, uh, that Pentecostal period, those 250 year jubilees from 1903 
1901, the baptism of the Holy Ghost was poured out in Topeka, Kansas, but it was 1903 before it was really established across America through the uh, Azusa Street Mission in Los Angeles, California, is where uh, it really began to, God really began to bless that Pentecostal uprising and our movement, and it began to flow across America started the Pentecostal movement. Then we have the month, 30 days in a month is 30 years, and then the hour. We've always looked at a prophetical hour is 15 years, and that's by taking the 360 years. If you take a year, you put it into years, you take a year of uh, Israel had 360 days in their year. And so if you take 360 days and divide it by 24 hours in a day, it turn, it's 15. 15 times 24 is 360. So 15 years in a prophetical hour is how we've always looked at that. And so we're if we're right on our timetable, then from 2003, there's 45 years left. Now, we've looked at, and Brother Leninger and I both worked on it. Of course, Brother Leninger was the chief prophet working on a uh, timetable. I really do believe Brother Leninger was probably one of the greatest prophets of the body of Christ since William Souders um, up until his day. And... Uh, so he worked on time frames and prophetical scripture, and most of the brethren looked to Brother Leninger for insights into the prophetical scriptures that, that uh, deal with the end time. Anyway, if, if that's true, there's a 30-year a period that we're in since 2003 which would take us to 2033, and then there would be 15 years, which would take us to 2048. Uh, and that 15 years, the bo body would be restored. I have been doing some considering, and I, I've told the people here locally, uh, I've always felt like that it would take a restored church to make uh, for a person to reach perfection. I am considering, since we, we've always looked at it, we're going in the back door. In other words, the early church, you know, it started out with a divine order on the day of Pentecost, and then it began to wane as, as it began to fall away. There were still people making perfection even at the time that the church was falling away. Um, uh, the church wasn't falling away back in the day. The height of what God was doing in the harvest in the end of the Jewish world. And uh, so, uh, but as it, as it began to fall away and false prophets began to come in, there was falsehood that came in there. Um, uh, there was still some time for people to make the bride of Christ. And, you know, I am considering uh, that there will be some, in other words, if we take the white horse, the white horse didn't change from white to red overnight. It got, it started getting red hairs in it. That was those false prophets. That was those men that had lack of understanding and that was, uh, corrupting the word of God, uh, that is the third trumpet that talked, it was uh, uh, bitter, bitterness. What was it? A star fell and uh, bitterness uh, was put in the water and uh, that was called wormwood. That's what wormwood means, bitter. And many people, it says many people, that were in the in the sea died, and so people, though no doubt those were God's people, 
uh, they went out of the body of Christ uh, and they died because of the falsehoods that was being planted back there. And so if we're coming in from a fallen church back in, then there will be, uh, we're in no doubt a red horse state. That's what the Pentecostal era is. If you go back to the horses in chapter six of the book of Revelations, the white horse, and I hope everyone's able to follow me on this. I think most of you have enough of this message that you know what I'm talking about. The white horse represented the early church in that 45 year period. The red horse represented a Pentecostal era. And that would have been a hundred year period of time. Uh, and then it turned from red to black, which was sin, red the color of sin. Sin entered the church. Then, uh, and in the, in the ninth chapter of the book of Revelations, it talks about the restoring time that, that when these four angels were loosed out of the river Euphrates, that, um, that was a, a, rest, a period of restoration of the Protestant movement, the Pentecostal movement, and see even uh, when it got to the white horse at first, that white horse would have been like during the time of the falling away in Israel. And it said that their, their heads were like lions. They, they had the word of truth, the head, the leadership, but their tails were like serpents. And the, the serpent uh, represents a, a, a ministry of falsehood. And so as that restoration period was taking place, uh, there were still falsehood taking place. And if we'll be honest with ourselves right now, we are in a red horse state. There's still, we still do not have all of the truth. It's a sevenfold light. We're working on it. Everyone ought to be praying for the ministry. And um, so I don't see that anyone has, has maybe they have. Uh, there's not very many people that's responded saying we've got Zoom. So for right now, Zoom would probably be out. Um, anyway, um, the reason I'm I'm wanting to the reason I'm wanting to do that and I will do it uh, on some in some measure may not for this broadcast but Zoom is I can show my screen you can see me and you can see my uh, my computer screen where I have my Bible up and I can show you my Bible and read it to you and show you what I'm talking about at the same time and you can see me do that. I found out I could do that this this week on Zoom, so I'm excited about that, especially for our Zoom Bible studies that we have on Monday nights in the Dominican Republic and Mexico and other places. But anyway, getting back to this, uh, I have considered since we're going in the back door that we may be getting close to a place that some of those white hairs uh, reaching perfection may be possible for those that are really connected to the truths of, of today's present truth. There may be enough truth for that. I do believe it'll take mostly a re restored church for that to happen, but I am considering it, and there's reasons that I am because of, um, of um, some of the scriptures that I'm dealing with in the book of Revelations. Um, uh, one of the things that we've work, been working on in, in church, I worked on last Sunday, was the seven vials in the 16th chapter of the book of Revelation. And um, I think God is helping me to understand those vials a little bit better. Um, if uh, 
Um, if you want to turn with me to the 15th chapter of the book of Revelations, and again, um, if this is boring you because it, <laughs> you know, I remember I took a young man uh, to a meeting in Tyler, Texas years ago. It wasn't very long after I came to the body and I've been here for 43 years, I think. So uh, we hadn't been in very long and Brother Leniger was there and he was talking on the horses. And when we left that meeting that day, the young man that was with me, in fact, he was, he was my age. We were both young men. And um, he said, I didn't understand a thing that man said today. It was, he said, that just went way over my head. So I'm always trying to be mindful. I, I don't want, uh, you know, I don't want to bore people with the word of God, but it is important, I think, that the people here, and we are, I believe, we're engaged in the latter time of the Gentile world. And I think the people of God need to know these things need to be gone over. And uh, there's, I don't think there's too many people working on it. Uh, I think it's, a, it's partly my plot. I think that's part of my gift that God's dealt with me now for, oh, I would say 30 years on the book of Revelations, but um, uh, I'd say the last 20, God's really dealt with me on it. And, and uh, I feel like I can explain the book, but... The more I delve into it, the more I uh, see in it. It's, it's kind of like the rest of the Bible. But uh, anyway, if you'll turn with me to Revelations, the 15th chapter, this is only what it, I think it's got eight verses in it, and it's a prelude to the 16th chapter. It's right after the 14th chapter speaks of the harvest and the end of the Gentile world. And, uh, and, and that's what these chapters are talking about, that harvest that's taking place. And so these seven last plagues are part of the harvest. Um, let's start in the first verse. It says, I saw, I'm in Revelations 15, 1. It says, I saw another angel, another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Well, I want you to know that the last prophetical hour or the last, I'll say, uh, it may include part of the 30th, uh, the 30 years, uh, that la la the last uh, 15 years, the last trumpet. Uh, so during that time, seven angels are going to pour out the last plagues, which is fills up the wrath of God. The day of the Lord is a 45-year period in the end of the Jewish world. And that, uh, it's also called, it's called the day of the Lord. It's called the day of the Lord's wrath. It's called uh, the day of the Lord's vengeance, the uh so all of this is going to take place in that harvest. God's going to judge that world with this ministry before Armageddon. And so, and here where it says there's a great marvelous seven angels having the seven last plagues. Well, uh, if you remember when Jesus uh, had his uh, disciples uh, take up a little boy's lunch. I think it was, was it five loaves and two fishes? And there was a whole host of people all over the mountainside. And he said, pass it out to the people to eat. And they said, with this little bit of food, and he said, pass it out. And they began to pass it out. And it never, it just kept being more fishes, more bread, and after they fed everybody, it was taken up in seven baskets. Uh, I think that's a picture that what that ministry had back there, that seven is a number of uh, 
it's a perfect number of completeness. And I believe that this ministry down here represents those seven baskets. We have, we're going to have what that ministry had. And uh, the same thing that they fed the people back there in the church is going to be left to us. We'll get it in the restored church. And so I don't, I don't believe that there'll be a 12 exact apostles down here. It probably will be more. Uh, as far as chief apostles, we won't know until God lifts them up and lets us know which, who they are. But uh, there, this seven angels represents the, the ministry down here, and it would be an apostolic ministry. And the, the apostles would, would definitely be the chief men that gave out these messages. Seven angels having the last, seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Well, the sea of glass is something I have changed on. I, I, I have, even up until recently, I taught that the sea of glass was the labor but I'm, God's been dealing with me here of late. And um, uh, let me see if I can give you a couple scriptures. Uh, in, um, I just read you that one. And these men having the seven lakh plagues, they, they saw a sea of glass mingled with fire. That's judgment. And them that had gotten victory over the beast, over his image. See, the image hadn't even been set up yet, but we're, I, I recently gave things that has to happen before the end of the Gentile world. Number one, the body's got to be restored. Number two, um, uh, the Lord is going to have to get all of his people out of Babylon. God is going to judge Babylon. He, he will judge that after he gets everyone that will respond to him to get them out of Babylon. Once, once he got all of his people come out of her, my people, then he will judge her. He, there won't be any more of the sound of the millstone, the trumpet, the light of the candle, the sound of the millstone, the voice of the bride or the bridegroom. God will remove all that. It's going to be dried up. That's one of the plagues that takes place here is Euphrates is going to dry up. That's going to take place in this last uh, harvest of God in the end of this world. And these that were standing on the sea of glass, I'll give you a, a scripture or two on that. But I feel like God helped me to see something better on. Uh, in Revelations 21, 18, it says, And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, likened to clear glass. In other words, that city, that restored church, is going to be uh, crystal clear. It's going to be like pure gold. See, God's going to have restored it to its fullness. In verse uh, 21 of Revelation 21, it said, And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were temp transparent glass. And so, uh, in other words, the, the, the street of it, you know, the way, Christ, he said, I'm the way and the truth. He was pure in every way. And so I think we can use that uh, for the sea of glass better than uh, using it. The reason I used it before was in the fourth chapter of the book of Revelations. There was John saw a restored church and he saw a sea of glass before the throne. And you know, the lavers, what's before the throne, and Solomon's temple, 
it was called a, lab, a brazen sea. And uh, so that's how I used it just up until here recent. I just, God's dealt with me about it. I feel like I've seen these scriptures and I know at this time, the church is going to be restored and it makes, it's far, it's more reasonable, or at least I'll say this, it's reasonable to believe that the sea of glass is the restored church. They were standing in a, on a restored church situation, having the harps of God, and they sang the song of Moses. I'm in verse three of chapter 15. The song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. That's the Old and New Testament, to be able to harmonize that and be able to, you know, when you sing a song, it has to be in harmony. It, it, you have to have the, you have to be able to harmonize the words in it. They have, it has to make sense. Well, here in a restored church, we're not going to have men teaching one thing about one doctrine and something else, another man teaching something else. God's going to help us to see eye to eye and get these differences ironed out. Um, then he said, saying, Lord God, uh, great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of the saints, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name, for thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Uh, and all nations that God is dealing with in the end of the Gentile world, I think something ought to be said about that because we're not going to win the whole world in the end of the Gentile world. There, that's going to take place in the thousand-year millennial reign. What God, right now, what God has done in restoring the church, he has restored uh, his church in the United, he's restoring it in the United States of America. This is the land that God chose to put um, together his ministry and uh, develop the body of Christ. No one even heard of the church being called the body since the early church until Brother William Sowers got that message. That happened here in America. And God has poured out more in America than any other nation in the Gentile world. And so God, this is where God chose to do this. It, doesn't have anything to do about how good we are or that we're better than anyone else. It has to do with the fact that this is where God sent his people um, into the Western world to find uh, freedom of religion. God's the one that put it in our forefathers to do that and to uh, erect a constitution that separated church and state. And God did that so that he would have a place to restore his church. And that's what God has been doing since America has been here. And um, so I know America is going to be judged. Uh, God never deals with a nation like he dealt with Israel. He's, uh, and then they turn on him. He will, he will judge them. And he, you know, uh, uh, America has received more blessings from God than any other nation in the Gentile world since the falling away of the church, and America will be judged. When you look at the terrible condition of our government and the people that are running our government, they're literally destroying America and what it was built on, but it is a democracy, and democracy only can last a short period of time because there's too many loopholes in, in democracy. And uh, they're finding those loopholes. Our, our forefathers never, ever had in their, their minds what our current politicians are doing with the Constitution of the United States. They, never, they intended for this country to be a Christian country too, one nation under God. God, the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they never intended this country to have any kind of God that anybody wants to worship in it or any kind of immoral thing to be uh, even put into law in this country. So uh, our, our, our leaders in this country have lost their morality 
and they, they, they have no fear of God nor fear of righteousness or the word of God. And so I know God will judge this nation. That's one of the things I said will have to happen before the end of this world. God will judge America. Let me add this to that. God won't, he's not going to destroy America, the whole nation. He's just going to take it down. It will no longer be a superior nation. Uh, it won't be a dragon power either. And uh, it, it, God is going to deal with this nation. I don't have any doubt about that. That's what's going to make room for the 10 kings that will come into rulership after God judges America. I said, God will have to judge America. He'll have to restore the church, the body of Christ. He'll have to get his people out of Babylon. He'll have to judge Babylon. He will have to make up the mark of, he will have to make, the image to the mark of the beast. Then the eighth head will have to come into existence. Then the 10 kings will have to come into existence and the seven plagues will have to finish the judgment of God upon this world. So there's a lot that's got to happen. And I say it's going to happen in a fairly short period of time. And I think the people of God are to be really focused and diligent about preparing their hearts uh, just like during this pandemic. Let's prepare our hearts and get as close to God as we can get to God. Uh, anyway, let me go back to the 15th chapter, verse 6. It says, And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen. That's the righteousness of the saints that garment change that's going to cause you to be pure and white and righteous. The seven angels are going to be working from a holy place, a restored church, and the judgment of God. Just like the early church had the judgment of God for the Jewish world, this ministry down here will have a judgment. This, this message, once God gets it fully restored and purified and sanctifies it, and, and it has a righteous ministry, it will exercise judgment on this world. And having their breasts girded with golden girdles. See, uh, Jesus had a breast uh, girded with golden girdles and golden girdle in Revelations 1. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who lived forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke and the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. I want to say something about that. Um, um, so, uh, Brother Jerome and Brother Painter and I were talking about this Sunday morning that it seems reasonable that this is talking about no man that these plagues were going to be poured out on could enter the temple. In other words, no one is going to be able uh, to reach perfection while this, uh, that, 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 that is getting these plagues poured out on them. And the plagues are being poured out because um, of disobedience and, and uh, rejection of God's message and that's going to be in his harvest. I think one of the ways to look at this is, is that um, if you look at the early church, see the judgment that came there in AD 70 a similarity to that down here will be Armageddon. And uh, God, in other words, will judge after he harvests this world like he harvested that one and ended it in AD 70's judgment. Well, Armageddon will do the same thing down here. And the wrath of God was poured out down there. See, uh, when we look at these, uh, if, if these plagues, they're not every one of them devastating plagues. Some of them are just severe punishment. God trying to correct 
he's actually pouring his wrath out uh, and dealing with this world and trying to turn people. Uh, one of the plagues said that even, you know, when he poured out a plague on the sun, that it scorched men with heat, but they still didn't repent of their sins. They blasphemed God instead. So uh, that's going to happen down here. There's no doubt about it. I mean, prophecy, God's prophecy won't fail. Um, and so I, I don't think that anyone that these plagues are being poured out on uh, until God finishes his judgment, uh, you, you, you know, a person's not going to be able to enter into God's temple while they're under God's severe judgment. Uh, if you go down to the 16th chapter, and I'm, I know I'm getting close to running out of time, but I'll deal with it here a little bit. Once again, uh, this is... Um, uh, you know, I am, uh, like I said, I'm using y'all as a sounding board tonight. So mm -hmm. forgive me, but I, I got to talk about this. It's it, it kind of like Jeremiah said, it's shut up in my bones. <laughs> and so I've got to get this off my mind some way. So y'all are the target. Chapter 16 said, I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Again, those seven angels is this ministry, apostolic ministry down here in a restored church. And verse two said, and the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell, fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshiped his image. See, that, that first vial there doesn't necessarily destroy anything, but it is a grievous sore. It is a terrible wound. If you look it up in the Greek, it's a severe wound. I would liken that if you, if you looked at the 13th chapter of the book of Revelations, I'm, I'm not going to go there right now, but it, uh, it, well, I will. Let's just go there right quick. It won't take us but a minute. Revelations uh, 13, is that verse 11? Yes. It said, now here, John saw these, these uh, seven beasts uh, come up out of the sea. If you go back to the first of this chapter, he's standing on the sea and he sees uh, seven uh horned beast, uh, I mean, seven-headed beast come up out of the sea. Uh, and, uh, but then here in the 11th chapter, he sees another beast coming up out of the earth. I still believe that this is the United States of America. The reason I do is because it did not come up out of the sea. And he had two horns like a lamb. And he spake as a dragon, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, which was the, which was the papacy, the Pope of Rome. The United States, we we haven't had a dragon power since the falling away of the of of Rome, the last dragon head of the of the dragon heads that have ruled the world. Uh, his rule was ended in 1798 when. Napoleon, the French general, put him in jail and ended his rule. Well, but now here, another beast comes up out of the earth. See, the earth is, is higher than the sea. Sea level is zero. I'm a pilot, so I know I had to, when I was a pilot, I had to pay attention of how far above sea level I was, uh, how high a mountain was above sea level, I had to know what altitude I had to fly at to be over things. And the earth is, is higher. It may not be very high if you're down around the coastal area, but it's still higher than the water. And here the earth, see there, what's a little higher than the sea? The sea, uh, the angel told John the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation that it was peoples, nations, and tongues. It's the world. But the religion is what's higher than the sea. 
uh, of belief in God coming out of the world is higher. It's, it's a higher place in life to recognize something about God. To, in, to delve into religion and try to find God is a higher condition. Well, this, this earth had two horns like a lamb, a civil power and a religious power. The United States of America had separation of church and state. Uh, our forefathers put it that way. But eventually the United States speaks as a dragon and it exercises all the power of the beast before him, which was Rome, the papacy. But then it is going to make an image to the beast. Verse 15 said he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. And so that and when when he makes a power when he makes an image to the beast, and then Revelation 17 shows us that the the eighth head, uh, the papacy will be given power again. And so, uh, and then after that, uh, America will go down. So uh, if you go back now to what I was saying in Revelation 16, that this, this was poured out on the earth, which I'm, I think it's reasonable to consider that God is going to give a, wound, a severe wound to the United States of America on the men that had the mark of the beast. See, they're the ones that's going to do it. And upon them which worshiped his image. See, the mark of the beast is, that comes after the image is set up. And so I can see where God is going to bring judgment on the United States of America and give it a deal at a, a very severe wound. In fact, if you go back with me to Revelation 6, where the seals are poured out, well, those seals, the horses were poured, you know, first the horses came about. And um, let me go back to Revelation 6. Okay. And so uh, the 12th verse in Revelation 6 I hope I'm not going too fast for you, but look, this is going to go on. By the way, we have a um, YouTube site, and that is FGC, Full Gospel Church, LR, Little Rock, Media, FGC, LR, Media. If you go to YouTube and search that, that page will come up, and it has all of our Bible studies on everything that I'm doing right now will be posted on YouTube, but it's also will be on our uh, Facebook page, our church Facebook page, uh, and it's on my Pastor Smith page. So uh, you should be able to get it on one or the other. Um, so if you go back to Revelation 6 and verse 12, it says, I beheld when he opened the sixth seal, Lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars fell from the earth. Even as a fig tree casteth her timely figs, she was shaken as a mighty wind, and heaven departed as a scroll when it rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. I believe that this earthquake right here is, the, is America going down. God will judge America. How I think that'll happen, I'm not absolutely certain, but I think there will be very possibly a war that will probably hit our coastal cities, our major military bases. You know, when we had 911 uh, and just those two planes hit the two towers in New York, it it affected this nation. It affected our our uh, uh, financial system. There's where a lot of our financial system, a lot of our records were kept. Uh, and that that was devastating to America, but this will be much greater than that. And so uh, it could happen. It could happen overnight. It can happen from within. 
you know, what that 911 showed us is that we're vulnerable. And so uh, I do believe America will fall as a great power, but the nation will still exist, just like when Russia fell. Uh, they didn't fall completely as a nation, but they were devastated for years. But I think this will be worse than Russia. Um, anyway, that, that's what's happened. America has been the lights, the sun, the moon, the stars. That's We've been lights to the world. That's what a dragon is, it, the lights. When God put Egypt out, if you go back and read it, uh, when he put Babylon out, he put the lights out. He turned off the sun, the moon, the stars, because those nations were lights to the world. And America's been a light to the world for many years now. And uh, But God's going to shake this world. And so verse 15 said, The kings of the earth, the great men, rich men, the chief captains and the mighty men, every bondman, every free man hid themselves and did dens and the rocks and the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of God. See, these plagues are going to be poured out in the wrath of God or from the wrath of the Lamb, it says. For great the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? And then the if you go down the seventh verse, this just continues after these things. I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, neither the sea or any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels and to whom it was given to hurt the earth. See, I think that earth is America and the sea. See, they're, they're, they're given uh, power to hurt the earth and the sea. That's the earth, it, the, the central part of it's America, but everything God has dealt with in the Protestant, Pentecostal, and body of Christ movements that brought about the harvest in the end of the world, which centered around America, is what this is talking about. And it's going to judge the sea also, those people of God that's wound up back out in the world. Not, not the ungodly, but God's people that wound up back in the world. They will be judged. They'll, they'll, God will try to get them out of the sea. He'll try to bring them out during the harvest and save them, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees. The trees are the people that are alive unto God till we have sealed our servants of God in their foreheads. Uh, and there was 144,000 sealed. So uh, if you want to go back now to the 16th chapter of the book of Revelations, uh, I'm, I'm about out of time here. I don't want to hold you over time, but I hope you've been able to follow me to some wit. Uh, verse 3 deals with the second angel. Revelation 16, 3, and the second angel poured out his vial on the sea and it became as the blood of dead men and every living soul died in the sea. In other words, see living souls, that's God's people out there. And everyone that did does not respond to the restored message of God when God begins to uh, give a sevenfold light and the power and demonstration of the Spirit in this final harvest in the end of the Gentile world, if they don't respond to it, uh, they're going to they're they're going to die. You know, wormwood back there in the third trumpet on the trumpet sound that was a picture of the church falling away, and it said many of the people in the sea died. That's because. Some of them, that see, it was in the falling away condition. Some of them had an opportunity to come on out, but many of them died out there in the sea. But here, we're going to have a restoration. It's not going to be falling away. Try to follow what I'm saying. We're coming in the back door. In other words, we're coming in from a fallen condition to a restored place. By the time it gets to a fully restored place, 
eternal judgment will be set up with those that won't respond and it'll all of them will die. But in the early church, it started out in a divine order or what we would call a restored condition today. And then it waned into a falling condition. So it's just the opposite. We're coming in a back door. It's going to work differently because things are going to happen slower moving towards perfection or to a perfect church, second heaven condition, so to speak. Verse four, and the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of water, and they became blood. Those rivers and fountains of water represent the people of God and the some of God's people that are in, they are in Babylon. They're in different facets of Christianity and God's going to deal with those people when he begins to get people out of that. But if they don't come out of it and they won't hearken to God and the message, that final message in the last prophetical hour, they're going to be judged out there in that system. It said they became blood. And verse five said, I heard the angel of the water say, thou art righteous, righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shall be because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the bloods of saints and prophets and thou hast given them blood to drink for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, even so, Lord God, mighty true and judge righteous are thy judgments. See, the apostle Paul was one that fought, uh, put people in prison. People were killed because of the apostle Paul when he was a Pharisee until God opened his eyes. See, there he was in that condition, but God was able to get him out of it. Well, there's going to be people in this condition down here that if they won't come out, they are going to be judged and they're going to put in with the image and mark of the beast, and they're going to be against the body of Christ. You, you're going to fight the body of Christ if you're not a part of it before this is over with, because if you join with the beast, you'll have to. They'll be against the body of Christ, just like the Jews were against Christ. Verse 8 said, the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. In other words, it gets more intense here. God pours out a, a, a fiery judgment. He really begins to judge men with a great judgment. And the men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. See, God did that to try to get them to humble down, repent of their sins, and turn to God. But they, those that don't are going to be receive this severe judgment of God. And it may and probably will turn into a sore punishment. That word sore punishment Peter used is an eternal judgment, and there's no returning back from that. That's blasphemy, rejecting God fully. Verse 10 says, and the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast and his kingdom was full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues and blasphemed the name of God because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. So the seed of the beast, those that are in authority of the beast system in the end of this world, uh, it's, it's gonna be full of darkness and they're going to, uh, blaspheme and reject God in every way. God's not going to, he's going to deal with it. Just like Jesus dealt with the Pharisees and Sadducees and Elamites and all of those Jude Judaizers that were against Christ, but they blasphemed God. They did not, it did not change. Verse 12 said, the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. There's when God's going to judge Babylon. You see, uh, the papacy will be the head of the beast. He's already judging. He poured out on the seat of the beast in the fifth vial, getting ready 
And because there was no uh, response to that, God judged that system and the sixth vial dried up Euphrates or Babylon. That's what that represents. And that prepared the way of the kings of the east. The 10 kings are come into power when they see that the eighth head of the beast is going to begin to wane. And it says, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast and the false prophet. That's the civil power, the dragon, the beast, the religious power, Catholicism and the false prophet, the Pope. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to battle of the great day of God Almighty. Uh, that's what these unclean spirits like frogs. You know, Brother Linegar used to love to preach on that, and he'd say those frogs were gathered around the waters and saying, Rome, Rome. That's how frog sounds, you know, croaking. And that's what frogs are doing when you're out in the country around a big pond or body of water and you hear frogs croaking. They're all gathering all the frogs together. They're saying, we found food. And also it is they, the, re, that, the reason they do that, especially in the summertime, it's their breeding season. And that's a picture of religion, gathering everything together to produce what they want to produce in the beast system. And so that's why it says uh, to gather them together to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments. See, keep those linen white garments of righteousness, lest you walk naked and they see his shame. They shall see his shame. Verse 16 said, and he gathered them together into place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. There was voices and thunderings and lightning and great earthquakes such as, as was not since men were upon the earth since mighty and an earthquake. Uh, so uh, I could go on, but I'll, I'm going to go ahead and stop here tonight. But um, I will say that um, earthquake that I mentioned in the sixth chapter, I think it's the same earthquake in the 11th chapter that uh, America will fall. It's one of the first things God's going to do is judge America after it sets up the image uh, of the beast uh, and turns against God. Um, we used to teach that that earthquake was World War I, but it, that, you know, that's just the best we could come up with. Warm World War One wasn't a near a great event to fit that prophecy but this will fit it. It's dealing with the end of the world. You have to look at it in chronological order. World War I was too far back in the past, but, but America is going to be in the very heat of what God's going to do in the end of this world. So let me encourage you to, to just be diligent. Add to your faith virtue, virtue knowledge, Knowledge, temperance, temperance, patience, patience, godliness, godliness, brotherly kindness. Finally, you will add the brotherly kindness, charity, which is the love of God. And Peter said to be diligent. And he said, if you'll add these things, you'll never fall. And so an entrance will be made into the everlasting kingdom of our God and his Christ. So work on diligence. Be diligent to serve him right now. Don't, don't get complacent because of this. Uh, we've been in this COVID thing. Uh, shut in in many ways. And we've, we've had loved ones die. Uh, God has done things to make us realize. Look, when God's judgment comes and he deals with us, we need to respond. We need to respond and say, God, 
I know you're dealing with your people. You know, if your people didn't do anything wrong, you'd be blessing them. But if you if if there's things where things happen, and the what did what did Solomon say? In the day of adversity, consider. So let's work on get, trying to get closer to God and being diligent and serving him. And he will open up these many scriptures to us and help us to understand the future. Wasn't it Amos that said, God doeth nothing, but he first shows it to his prophets. God will show you what's going to happen and God will help you to respond and get ready for what's going to happen. And just remember this. What God's going to do to this world, it's God will protect the body of Christ in it. Stay in the boat. Stay in the body of Christ. Stay diligent. Stay faithful. Serve God. He will bless you. We're still right now living in, even though America's falling away from God, it's still the greatest nation in America, and there's still peace. So, uh, be thankful for that and use that to in, in, encourage yourself in the Lord. Keep serving him. Keep moving up. Don't look down. Don't only look up to the hills from whence cometh your help. Your help comes from the Lord, the, the, the King of Kings. Oh, God. So, Stay encouraged in the Lord. God bless your hearts. I'll see those of you that are local uh, here in church Sunday morning. See it. Bible study, breakfast before Bible study at 930. We'll see you then. Thank you all for sharing this time with me. And and um, I hope, I, I'll tell you what I wish some of you would do. I wish some of you would type in a comment. Don't do this unless you mean it. I wish you'd tell me if you enjoyed this. If it was boring to you, you, can, you don't have to say anything. But I need a little bit of encouragement to know that the people of God are glad that I'm talking on some of these things. I do believe you need it. So I'm hoping that, uh, I'm hoping that, that you're getting it because I think it is, it's the word of God and it's prophecy that's gonna happen. I believe in our generation, so. I think you need it. God bless you all. I love you, people of God. I love the word of God. Have a good night. And again, I'll see those of you local um, this weekend, Sunday morning. God, not, God bless and good night. Pray for me and I'll pray for you.